I want to take, uh, and by the way, I, one of the things, when you're not used to doing this all the time, you forget something. Um, if, if you uh, are a guest uh, today, we, we really are thankful and grateful to God that you're here. Um, if you would uh, fill, this, fill this out and help us to connect with you and, and know more about you, and also if there's any way that we can serve you or minister to you or come alongside you, uh, especially if you're in a, in a difficult uh, time in your life, we, we want to do that. So if you would uh, fill that out and uh, uh, just uh, hand it to uh, one of us or just set it back there on the table uh, at the end of the service, we'd appreciate it. We had a uh, responsive reading, and I'll just summarize that. That was one of the other things that I uh, forgot to do earlier. <laughs> um, in Hebrews uh, chapter 6 and verse 10, um, the writer says, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work, and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. It's interesting to think about the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. not forgetting our work. That he would even be mindful of our work is interesting. Before we get into our, our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, I want you to think with me for just a minute. I want you to imagine that your life has been spent doing a great work. And that this work was important. It began early in your life and it continued all the way throughout your life. And it was so important to you that as you continued working, doing this great work, that it influenced several different things. It influenced your children and how they were raised and what they saw. It influenced your friends. It even influenced gatherings with other people, family reunions, celebrations, weddings, funerals. That's how pervasive this great work was in your life. Your entire life was dedicated to this work, and at the end of, the, at the end of your life, you found out that this work, this great work that you had spent your entire life engaged in, was not worthwhile. The work in and of itself is important. But in the eyes of your Lord and Savior, it was not worthwhile. It was not the work that we would see Jesus doing while he was here on this earth living. That this isn't just imagery. And this isn't just a story. This is real life. All of us are faced with the decision of spending our lives engaged in worthless work or in worthwhile work. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 58. And by the way, in a previous chapter, chapter 3, Paul says, According to the grace given to me, like a skilled master, laid, I, I laid a foundation, and someone else built upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it. See, this great work that we were just thinking of. At some point in our lives, we'll have an opportunity to answer. He continues on in chapter 3 to say, um, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work 
will become manifest for the day will disclose it. All will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. This term, each one here in chapter 3, isn't just restricted to preachers and teachers and deacons. Everyone is engaged in building a structure. The question is, is it on the foundation of God's word? So with this in mind, let us take a look at chapter 15. This is just one verse, uh, so you can remain seated. But our text says, So then, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Don't let anything move you. Always give yourselves completely to the work of the Lord because you belong to the Lord and you know that your work is not worthless. Father, help us to clearly understand this passage. So move in us with your spirit that we will have a desire to not only be hearers of the word, but be committed to being doers. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul had two basic um, purposes for writing 1 Corinthians. One was to reprove the Christians for flagrant sins that had been in their congregation. And the second was to answer questions. It's thought that somehow there were some questions written down and it had gotten back to Paul and he was responding back to those questions. And in writing this, this book, he kind of breaks it up into three main parts. The first one is in uh, chapters 1 through 6 and it addresses disagreements that had come up. And these disagreements are important not because of necessarily what the agreement was about, but these disagreements are important because disagreements undermine unity. Unity is paramount. <laughs> it is important that we are in lockstep, not necessarily with just one another, but in lockstep with God's word and the gospel. The second uh, part of this book is in chapters 7 through 14. Paul writes about all kinds of different things. Uh, marital issues, liberty and responsibility, spiritual gifts, church order, uh, money that he wanted to collect uh, for those um, who were at the, in the church in Jerusalem. And then in verses or chapters uh, 15 and 16 he writes about the resurrection and then in verse 16, he concludes with some remarks to the congregation that he held so dear. So, in the verse that we're looking at, it comes at the end of chapter 15, and he has just gone through this discourse of the resurrection. The actual, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And at the end of that, he says, So then, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Do not let anything move you, always giving yourself completely to the work of the Lord. <laughs> Chapter 15 is the most extensive treatment of the resurrection that we have in the scriptures. Both the resurrection of Jesus Christ as recorded in the Gospels and also promised in the Gospels are explained here. The hope of the resurrection makes all of the efforts and sacrifices of the Lord's work worth it. Why? Because of the resurrection. Because he will return. And he will gather all of his up to be with him for eternity. It's been said that 1 Corinthians 15.58 is Paul's hymn of praise. As his closing uh, admonition to the church. <laughs> 
Because of the assurance of Christ's victory over death, we know that nothing we do will be in vain. It will never be lost. It can't be. Because we know our labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15.58 is the answer to Ecclesiastes. You remember that? Solomon expressed his sad conclusion that all is vanity. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity, wept Solomon. But Paul, because of the resurrection, sings a different song. <laughs> it's a song of victory. And because of the resurrection, we can all sing this song of victory. He arose. He arose. That leads up to this last verse. And thinking through the actual physical bodily resurrection of Christ causes Paul to just erupt in this hymn of praise. I'd like to take a look at three different aspects of, of this passage. The promise of the resurrection of Christ identifies three things. One, the reason to remain steady. The promise of the resurrection of Christ identifies the reason we should remain working and also the reason to remain confident. So the promise of the resurrection of Christ identifies the reason we should remain steady. He says in the beginning of this verse, So then, my dear brothers and sisters, for the last time here in this letter, he addresses his recipients as dear brothers and sisters. Two other places he had used an affectionate term when he was talking to this congregation. Once in chapter 4 where he called them my dear children and then in chapter 10 where he calls them my dear friends. Each time he speaks to the Corinthians as a father would to his children. He remains a spiritual leader of Corinth who through the preaching of the gospel are his offspring. Paul is their pastor and he loves them even despite the numerous difficulties that they'd had. The second phrase in this verse says, be steadfast, immovable, or stand firm and don't let anything move you. Paul's command to the believers here for their steadfastness and he exhorts them to continue their dedication to the Lord. And just on a personal note, I want to thank you for your dedication. I want to thank you for your commitment. And I want you to know <laughs> from this passage, it is not overlooked. You're to be commended when you faithfully engage in the work of the Lord, even when it's not easy, maybe when it's not popular, here or outside. And our culture now is that it isn't always popular. Paul urges his readers and us to remain firm in the Lord and not to waver. Steadfast has the idea of being secure and unbending. But the most important part is I, I can be secure and unbending and be a terrible husband to my wife. <laughs> the most important part isn't that we walk away with the idea that I'm supposed to be secure and immovable. What am I supposed to be secure and immovable in is the most important thing. We are to plant ourselves in the gospel that Paul identified at the beginning of this chapter. We are to be secure and unbending in our faith in the resurrection, that's the context of this chapter, and in our conviction that we will be raised from the dead. That's what we are to remain secure and unbending in. 
Just as a reminder at the beginning of chapter 15, Paul said, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you and you received, in which you stand. For I delivered you as part of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised again on the third day according with the scriptures. That is to be what we are steadfast in. That in the, in the several verses that follow of the resurrection and all those who Christ appeared to after he was resurrected. Paul tells us and tells the Corinthians to be immovable. Do not be turned aside by any others. In Acts chapter 14 verse 22, he says, Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. This faith is what we are to be steadfast in and immovable in. Paul tells the early Corinthians um, to continue in the faith or to persevere. Perseverance has been called a badge of true saints. The Christian life is not only a beginning in the ways of God, but also a continuance as long as life lasts. One commentator noted that perseverance, perseverance is the target of all our spiritual enemies. He said, the world does not object to you being a Christian for a time, but if our enemy can but tempt you to cease your journey in the faith, to to settle down and become complacent. The flesh will seek to ensnare you and to prevent you from pressing on to glory. It is weary work being a pilgrim on the way to heaven. Come and give up. These are the things that we will hear throughout our life. Satan will make many fiery attacks on our perseverance. It will be the mark for all his arrows. He will strive to hinder you in service. He will insinuate that you are not doing any good. And wouldn't you like to just rest? Just for a little while. He will endeavor to make you weary of suffering. He will whisper as he did to Job, just curse God and die. Or he will attack your steadfastness. What's the good of being so zealous? He will whisper. Be quiet like the rest. Sleep as others do. Or he will criticize your doctrinal beliefs, saying, Why do you hold to these denominational creeds? Sensible men are being more liberal. They are removing old landmarks. Fall in with the times. But we are exhorted, wear your shield, Christian. Close up your armor and cry mightily unto God that by his spirit you may endure to the end. This is our calling. So this passage commands us to remain steady and it also the promise of the resurrection identifies the reason we are to remain working. <laughs> it's one thing to remain steady. It is quite another thing to remain working. <laughs> Always abounding in the work of the Lord. After telling his readers not to be moved in their faith in the resurrection, Paul encourages them to excel in the Lord's work. Staying busy in the Lord's work in obedience is laying treasures up in heaven. This is the guarantee that our earthly work and labor is not in vain, but has an eternal reward. Notice how Paul builds on this command. And I'm going to scoot over to the end of this little short segment and talk about the work of the Lord. He says, do the work of the Lord. But he builds upon that as he approaches this end command of do the work of the Lord. Not just do it, 
but abound in doing the work of the Lord. Abound here is abundant. It's to be excessive, exceed in number or measure. And in the New Testament, it has more the idea of more than enough. When we were singing these songs of worship, I got the picture in my mind that God was more than enough. (laughs) And here we see this, this exhortation not only to do the work of the Lord, but do it in abundance, do it in excess. So however much work of the Lord we think would kind of get us by, (laughs) that's not enough. We shouldn't be asking ourselves, how much can I do? What else can I sacrifice? Those are the things that we should be engaged in. What else can I give up for the kingdom of God? When several years back, I got to thinking through the resources that I'd been given. (laughs) It's astounding. I'm healthy. I'm breathing. (laughs) This allows me to do all kinds of activities here in this community, in our community at large, in our state, and around the world. We live in the United States. That in and of itself means we don't don't have to worry about where we're going to get food or water or is it clean? Will I get sick if I drink this or eat that? I have a passport. I can travel anywhere in the world I want to go. Anywhere. Can you imagine that? There are a lot of countries where you can't do that. I have a beautiful place to worship, people to worship with in this body of believers called Bethel. I have a house. How am I using that for God's kingdom? We have a little bit of land. What am I doing with that? I've got a car. I actually have more than one car. (laughs) How are those things being used to abound in doing the work of the Lord? We we, we can't just think about what am I doing here at church. That's, That's not abounding. This certainly is part of it. We are to always abound. He adds on even another layer now. So do the work of the Lord was this initial command. Abounding in this or always doing it into excess is another part of it. And then he adds on a third. Always. (laughs) So not only are we commanded to do the work of the Lord, we're commanded to excel and exceed in that work of the Lord, but it's not just to be periodic. It's not just to be during certain phases of my life, certain times when I think, I've got everything else kind of under control, so it's okay. (laughs) Always having and doing more than enough work of the Lord. The full impact here is just that. At all times, do more than enough work of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? At all times, do more than enough work of the Lord. This sounds like God's kind of taken over here. (laughs) Well, he is. If you have placed your faith and trust in Christ, you are his servant. The servant should do nothing more and nothing less than the bidding of his master. And we had an amazing example when he sent Christ here to live among us. What a great way to understand how we are to live. And when he died... What a great way to understand how we are to sacrifice. So the work of the Lord is something that we need to think about. What is the work of the Lord? Well, it certainly could entail preaching and sharing uh, the gospel, applying the contents of Scripture to our lives, edifying one another, Loving our neighbor as ourselves, 
It consists of an earnest desire to keep God's commands and to do so out of gratitude for our salvation provided through his son. This is the context of always abounding, exceeding. Why? Because it's in the context of God's gift. And it's in the context of Christ's death. That frames our understanding of always abounding and doing more work of the Lord. So the work of the Lord is sharing the gospel, growing in grace and truth, loving and edifying others. And we see this in our purpose statement. Follow Christ, love God, love others, and serve the world. How do we help someone follow Christ? They need the gospel. They need to understand what it means that Christ died for the sin of all who would believe. They need to understand that. And just as a side note, we can't take it for granted that the people that we come in contact with in our society today have any understanding of that. When I was growing up, it was safe to assume that. It's not safe to assume that today. It also involves applying the contents of, li- of Scripture to our lives, edifying one another, loving our neighbors, we love ourselves. These are things that we see embodied in our purpose statement. How do we help ourselves and others love God and, and love others? We have to grow in truth and in grace. And we have to have both. I can grow in truth and not be any, edi- any more edifying to you at all. I've got to grow in truth so that I know what standard to hold myself to. And I have to grow in grace as we interact throughout life. So I know how to treat you. I've heard it described as throwing a blanket of love over other sins especially when they're against me. Repentance and forgiveness. And why do we serve the world? That's our mission field. This is where we are to do the work of the Lord on this planet. Our purpose purpose statement describes the great commandment given in Matthew 22 and the great commission. We're to love the Lord, our God, with all of your heart, soul, your mind, and and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Our purpose statement also has the great commission embodied where it says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, as I began thinking through this work of the Lord and trying to describe it, and how am I supposed to be living this out day to day, it dawned on me that I had seen some of this before. (laughs) You remember a few years back when we all went through real-life discipleship in, in our life groups, Just as a reminder, I just want to just touch on this again. You remember this? I remember trying to have to fill that thing. It was blank, right? And I remember trying to fill that thing out and not remembering all the pieces of it. This is just one attempt to help us understand what does it mean to make disciples. And if we look through each part of this, each segment, follow Christ, that's how our purpose statement fits into this model. It's about sharing. It's about um, helping people understand and connect with what do the scriptures mean. Sharing your life. Sharing God's word. And then second part, to love God, which is connect. So the first thing we need to be doing is sharing our lives, uh, 
the, our, our understanding of Scripture? What does it mean to live biblically as a husband, as a wife, as a citizen here? And then connecting with others. Connect them to God. Connect them with a group or a family like this one. And then connect them to a purpose, not just living for them, living for God. As we strive to live for God. The next section, love others. Equip each other for the ministry. Provide minister opportunities and then release to go do ministry. This is how we love others. I can tell you that I love you. But it will never, never have the meaning until I give of myself to love you. Now you know. And how are we asked to give? Our model, Jesus Christ, demonstrated that for us. Day to day, living life with other people. The last part of this is to serve the world. Release people to minister here and throughout the world. The Burgesses are a great example of that. The Turners are another example of that. Our long-term commitment uh, to Haiti and to our sister church there. I would encourage you, if you haven't looked through this again, or haven't looked through it in a while, to pull this out. You'll be hearing a little bit more about these in days to come. This is the work of the Lord. So the question must be asked, how well am I doing the work of the Lord? One of the difficult tasks of coming and preparing <laughs> is wrestling with this for the last couple of weeks. How are you doing? How well are you doing the work of the Lord? How well are we at all times doing more than enough work of the Lord. God has assured us that he will build his church. Unequivocally, no questions asked, he has stated that he will build his church. So the question I have to ask is, how has he determined that he will accomplish this? What did we see Christ doing while he was here, beginning to build this church? He was making disciples, living day to day with people, giving of himself, waking up in early hours of the morning while it was dark to pray, <laughs> living life hard pressed with the crowds continuing to explain to his disciples over and over and over again the simple truths of, of what we see here as scriptures. <laughs> Jesus modeled this of how God will grow his church. He made disciples. We are to make disciples. by sharing, connecting, training, and releasing. And if you're like me, you may be struggling with this, and Linda and I have had numerous conversations. What does this mean that I'm supposed to make disciples? Okay, I, I got the wheel thing, I got that, I kinda got that, I understand that. What does that mean I'm supposed to do? How do I find somebody to disciple with what my life looks like and my schedule? When is that supposed to happen? How do I increasingly become more outward focused and love my neighbor like I love myself? How do I grow in grace and love God and others more? <laughs>
As I began preparing this, I realized there wasn't any way I could get through the depth of this and the application of this just this Sunday. So I asked pastor if I could continue this next Sunday, and he said, sure. So we're going to pick part of this up next Sunday. But let's look at this last part. The promise of the resurrection of Christ identifies the reason to remain confident. Why? Knowing that your labor is not in vain. Whatever it costs you to abundantly do the work of the Lord will not be in vain. Regardless of what it looks like here on earth, regardless if anyone ever notices, regardless of anyone has any idea what it costs you, your labor will not be in vain. Such labor given freely in service of the Lord is never in vain because the Lord himself blesses his servants. Our labor will bear fruit, if not in this lifetime, then the one to come. This is the promise to every laborer in the Lord's vineyard. The resurrection is proof and down payment of our reward. If we cultivate a heavenly perspective, it will not matter whether you receive any reward here or not because you know you will be rewarded in heaven. Spurgeon said this comment, and you, if, if you've read him any at all, <laughs> you know how he can just cut right straight to the quick. He says, what more can I say? Are there no ambitions among you? Consecrate yourself to God this day. If you have looked to Jesus and trusted him, serve him forever. Preach him if you can. Go abroad to the foreign field if you may. If you cannot do that, make money for him that you may give it to his cause. Open your shop for his sake. Let everything be done for Jesus. Take this henceforth as your motto. All for Jesus. Always for Jesus. Everywhere for Jesus. Why? He deserves it. Take a minute and think back with me again to what we started with. To a life that was dedicated to the work of the Lord. To a life that was giving sacrificially. To a life that demonstrated love for others. To a life that held firm to these principles and to the resurrection and to the gospel. So that friends and family members and children, workers, saw how we lived. And at the end, being able to conclude as Paul did in 2 Timothy 4, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. This is what we are to give ourselves for. The time for my departure is near, he continues. I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, not only to me, but all those who have longed for his appearing. This is the calling of every follower of Christ. This is my calling. This is your calling. You may need today, for the first time, to repent and place your faith. This sharing of the gospel may be the point where God comes to you and imparts his spirit. You may need to recommit yourself to the calling of God on your life to live for him forever. To take this quote from Spurgeon to be your motto, all for Jesus, always for Jesus, everywhere for Jesus. He deserves it. Wherever you are in your relationship with God, how will you respond to this calling on your life? Let's pray.